This is the Create Your Own Life Show, where we talk about things that matter. We're free thinkers and we don't believe in participation trophies. We're not afraid and unapologetically ourselves. It's time to create your own life. Hey, what is up, everybody? Jeremy here. It is Thursday. It is the 20th of January, 2022, and this is the Create Your Own Life Show. Uh, You probably tuned into this episode expecting a Thursday Thoughts episode of the show, and uh, this week we don't have one of those. We actually have a special interview um, that I did on Monday with James Lindsay uh, about critical theory, how it intersects with Marxism. And uh, how this whole thing actually connects back to the monetary system um, and this concept called the Great Reset. Um, so we're, we're going to be uh, giving you this episode in place of a Thursday Thoughts episode today. Uh, really in-depth conversation. A lot of really great points. Um, by background, uh, James was actually um, a mathematics professor And uh, he discovered a lot of this stuff and and what was happening in the university system. And uh, we dive into deep of, you know, how he discovered critical theory, what it is, um, how it connects to Marxism, um, how a work that Karl Marx wrote and uh, during his life was not released well until after he died, um, 1932 actually, um, has a huge effect on this whole thing as well. So... We're also going to talk about something called ESG scores uh, or environmental, social governance, um, and sustainability scores. I I think I flipped a couple things there. But anyway, we're going to talk about that um, in this interview as well um, and how that actually connects to the um, the, uh, International Monetary Fund and... and, uh, a lot of other things that we have going on. So um, it's interesting to kind of take a look at this. Uh, ESG scores is environmental, uh, social, and corporate governance scores. Sorry about that. And uh, we're going to be talking about how this whole thing um, connects with Klaus Schwab, um, who is at the World Economic Forum. Sorry, not International Monetary Fund. I'm trying to get my acronyms right as I'm recording this one um, a little bit later at night because we made the decision to, to run with this one. Um, rather than doing a Thursday Thoughts episode, and I, th- and I was pretty excited to get it out. Um, so we have this episode for you guys today. I'm very excited for it because um, it's really going to help you guys to understand you know, what's happening socially, how it connects to the economics of things, and how you can actually do something about that and what you can do about that. So a very, very informative episode. I learned a lot from James. Um, he is at Conceptual James on Twitter. I definitely recommend that uh, you go check him out. And just to kind of give you guys some ideas on some of the stuff we have coming up, we had a lot of really big wins this week in terms of content and things we were putting together, so I'm, I wanted to share some of that with you guys. Um, on Tuesday, we have a series of, of interviews um, that we're going to be running. Um, so next Tuesday, we have a great interview. We actually just wrapped up with James O'Keefe from Project Veritas. Um, this short-run series of podcast interviews, we're going to be talking about the media how it's changed, um, how it's you know a big player in you know what liberty is and what it's not. So Tuesday we have James O'Keefe. The following Tuesday we have Kyle Becker from Becker News, um, and I'm working on um, getting Darren Beatty from Revolver News into this and uh, Cheryl Atkinson as well. Um, I've reached out um, and I know Darren was interested, so we'll see what happens. I have not heard back from Cheryl yet, but I'm hoping we can. Uh, wrap her into this whole thing as well. So we could really talk about media, media integrity, independent news, and how it kind of fits into this whole thing. And uh, how you, as the person consuming news, uh, should know what to look for, um, how to use it, and how you can actually be empowered from it. So that's exciting. We also were reached out to uh, by Dell Bigtree's team as well, and we're going to have him coming on very, very shortly um, to talk about all things having to do with... uh, 
you know, the medical treatment we may or may not have a choice whether we take. So uh, we have that coming on. We have Dr. Stephanie Seneff coming on. A lot of great things coming up. So I'm excited to kind of dive into a lot of this stuff. But without further ado, let's get into... Well, actually, sorry, I forgot about our sponsors. So <laughs> sorry, sponsors. So shout out to a couple great companies that made this episode possible for you. Shout out to our friends over at MyPillow, who right now... Uh, you can get up to 66% off of select products if you use my promo code, which is C-Y-O-L over at MyPillow.com, up to 66% off of select products. Also, shout out to our friends over at Audible, who right now are offering you a free audiobook download and a free month of their service. Um, I am on to my new book. Uh, the latest book I am reading is Rigged, How the Media, Big Tech, and Democrats Seized Our Election by Molly Hemingway. It's pretty interesting because it, it pulls on a lot of threads that I wasn't quite familiar of. Um, so it's been very informative thus far. I'm about halfway through it. It's, it's a pretty quick read. So if you want to grab that book or any other book for free, head over to jeremyryanslate.com slash book. The show for the while, or you're new to the show, do not forget to subscribe to the show and uh, rate us, review us, and share us with your family and friends because we are all about making an impact. We're all about having you informed, and we're all about helping you to take action in your world and in your life. All right, without further ado, let's get into this interview with James Lindsay. Hey, what is up, everybody? Jeremy here, and guys, I am very excited for another episode of the Create Your Own Life Show as we have James Lindsay with us today, who is one of my favorite people to follow on Twitter. Um, not just for the information he spreads, but for some of the witty sarcasm he uses as well. So I'm excited to, to dive into the whole idea of cultural theory. What is it? The economic connections of it. James, thanks for hanging out with me today, man. Yeah, happy to be here. So I, I wanted to find out first and foremost, because um, um, back in 2012, you know, I had a teaching background and, and the school I was teaching in, they, they dropped letter grades, which seemed like the most insane thing to me, because like, it was like, why wouldn't you put a number score to something? And you had a not an experience quite like that, but it was an experience as a, as a teacher as well, uh, being a mathematics professor, you know, kind of realizing something crazy was going on. So, so tell us about that. Yeah, well, I didn't know that it was crazy at the time. I just, well, maybe I did. Uh, I knew that I didn't <laughs> want to teach under those conditions. So this would have been in 2000, maybe eight, nine, okay. maybe even seven. Um, I was teaching at the University of Tennessee, and we started to have kind of a change in tone of our faculty meetings where student retention became this really big issue. We had the Tennessee State uh, lottery with scholarships kind of passed. I don't remember exactly what year that started, sure. but we started to have lottery scholarships and this, the, the pressure became increasing by 07, 08, 09 for sure. That like, don't give kids grades and 100 level courses in particular that are gonna cause them to lose their scholarship. Let's try to keep them in school. And then it started to be, don't fail more than one or two students. And so this, this high emphasis on student retention, I just thought, I don't really, this is BS. I don't wanna give inflated grades and, you know, I get it. It's like, usually I'm teaching a service course, some introductory, you know, math or whatever for people who aren't gonna major in anything that needs math, but mm -hmm. I still don't really wanna participate in that. I don't think, that you should be able to get a college degree and be considered broadly educated if you can't do math at even like a grade school level or high school level. It's interesting and because so I know like for us, like it was a lot of, well, they wanted the athletes to keep playing because it was a really big like athletic school in New Jersey. So like, all right, well, if we fail them, they can't play. And it, this weird thing happened. And I don't know if you saw this as well is they gave like the, the weighted values to letter grades. So kids realize I can fail four out of five things, but if I get a C on one thing, I'm good. So it like created this like weird level of not achievement. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't have that in, in the colleges. There was the pressure from the athletics, but my working with the athletic department was mostly pretty good. The basketball group was a little bit more of a problem than the football group. Um, but on average, basketball players tended, uh, regardless of whether they male or female, black or white or whatever, they tended to be my worst students in every class I ever taught, right. uh, something, something about that. And so they always wanted to try to find pathways to extra credit and would kind of pressure us. But there was never any of this keep students at all costs or whatever attitude. And that was when it came down. It was all about the economics of the university. So what was really going on was under Clinton's administration, Bill Clinton's administration in the 90s, they passed federal underwriting of all student loans. And so now st student loans became super easy to get and they started being, they were just getting handed, handed out like 
candy, and we're going to deal with that crisis. It's going to be an economic crisis. Very, very, crisis. very soon. It's like more than the combined that's, credit card debt is the student loan debt. That's right, and it's about that bubble's about to pop on us. And um, the universities entered into a phase right when I was going, so this would have been like late 90s, um, of rampant competition for students. So you have, you know, three state universities. We don't have to name anything or whatever because I don't want to pin specifics that don't sure. apply. But they have, you know, they're competing to gather students because there's massive amounts of money now because there's lots of people coming in. It's probably all student loans. And what's the best way to attract students? You think it's going to be to have better academic programs, but it's not. Your average 18 year old does not give a crap about that, and they knew it. It was having a more exciting football team, but then also having a nicer dorm and having a fancier uh, student center and having maybe a bowling alley on campus and maybe even a movie theater, having a $20 million fitness and rec center that, that the students could work out and do. And it, like I thought it was great. My school had just built this when I went, this great fitness center, like $5 million or whatever. They were renovating. They renovated all the girls' dorms. The boys' dorms were a nightmare when I was there, but they renovated the boys' dorms afterwards. And these were gigantic mortgage level, you know, multi, not just multi million, but multi tens of millions of dollar investments. And in some cases, probably hundred million dollar plus investments into infrastructure they were using to attract students. So now the school is on the, the hook for these massive bills and they were raising tuition because that was no longer a limiting factor. If they raised tuition, the student loans that were federal, federally underwritten would just come in anyway. Mm -hmm. And so students were were paying with somebody else's money. They're, again, 18 when they're coming to college, maybe 22, 23 at the oldest by the time they're graduating. Not necessarily great on the old financial sense. And this looks like they're getting their education. They're going to get a good job. No discussion whatsoever is happening around the realities of the economy, that the economy can actually only absorb so many veterinarians, it can only absorb so many accountants, it can only absorb so many people with degrees in the humanities. And in particular, that's really bad because there's just not that many jobs for English majors and history majors and things like that. A lot of them. I, went I'm, I'm one of those those people that got a master's in history. It's like, what do you, what do you do with that? Oh, I, I guess I can just teach. say I'm an I'm an MA. That's about it. But like that brings that that's something we talk about a lot in the show. Like one of the biggest missing things, James, is there was that gap in the middle, and that's where apprenticeships were. Right? You work under yeah. somebody, you decide if you like it or not. Like not everybody has to go to college. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so what happens is you end up with this situation now where you're going to have lots and lots of people who have lots and lots of student loans, who can't pay them back. So we have this economic problem. That's We'll bookmark that for, for a while now. What you also have going on, though, is you now have this university system that sees this kind of river of gold, and all it has to do to get it is attract students. And the way that it can attract students is by offering very nice, very expensive amenities and has these huge mortgages it's now caught up in. While it's having its administrative expansion and administrative bloat, which is increasing, how do you coddle the students? How do you make the students feel at home? This is a home, not a, you know, we saw that at Yale when those kids blew up on Nick Christakis in 2015. That you're supposed to make Yale a home for us. And it's like, holy crap, what's going on? And so this was the attraction piece. And what this ultimately did, as far as like all this woke crap goes, is it set the stage for the universities to be held hostage to very small contingents of radical students. Mm -hmm. Basically, they'll show up in the student services office or whatever and say, or whatever office within the administration and say, you know, we're XYZ identity group and we're going to have to leave the college because we don't feel welcome here unless you make all these changes. And when student retention becomes so overwhelmingly core to the mission of the university that you're not willing to fail kids who can't pass calculus you've you've set your you've painted yourself into this corner where a very radical contingent is going to be able to push around the administration um the most fragile and narcissistic and uh, offendable students become the most empowered in terms of being able to dictate university policy i've talked to some university administrators who said we didn't impose wokeness from the top down faculty might have been teaching it but they said it was brought in administratively from the bottom up. The students were demanding it. And so what you, you kind of piece this all together and you see, well, why in the world did you give in? It's because they couldn't lose a single student in their minds because that student was a guaranteed thirty plus thousand dollars a year to pay off their two hundred million dollar mortgages that they'd built up to try to attract said students. So they'd trapped themselves. 
Um, and so now you see where kind of this woke economics crossover is happening and that where the ideology was able to manipulate this economic situation that was ultimately the result of bad policy from the 90s um, in order to create this absolute mess within the universities. And once those wokeify, then you have the university becoming a mill that produces professionals that are meant to infect other disciplines and other professional uh, avenues. And it's a lot of whom can't get jobs because the market's oversaturated. So they all go on and write blogs and spread the word and blame the system for their failures. And if capitalism worked better, we would have had a job. And you can see this whole s stage set through this generation and a half of students um, to, to it, it, get us in the mess we're in now. Because like I'm in my mid 30s and I, I look at my my generation and and you know a lot of them come out without any life skills, without any skills to do a lot of things, but they expect to make you know. Seventy, a hundred thousand dollars an hour at a school, and I think that's also one of the things we're seeing now. With you know, uh, we need a fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage and things like that. And it's like there's certain jobs that just aren't worth that. And you know, once inflation happens, your fifteen bucks isn't worth anything anyway. So it's this kind of really weird generation of kids coming out, which you know are in adulthood now, um, and it puts us in this weird environment. That's right. That's absolutely right. Um, the I remember when I started college again, this being the late nineties where people were discussing their prospects, you know, as we one does about what they're gonna what kind of good job they're getting. I remember people talking about why they were majoring in engineering and saying that if they got a solid engineering degree they'd be very happy because they'd be able to make forty five, forty eight thousand dollars a year out of college and work their way up to something in the six figure range with a successful career as they stuck with it. And that was kind of the mentality that we had that a college degree was a gateway to a solid middle class income that was expandable. And then I very rapidly while I was teaching, I remember, you know, maybe by 2007 and eight, seeing students who were utterly convinced that they're going to have a degree in some nonsense like film studies or whatever, and come out making six figures and anything less was an insult to their to their dignity, basically, and I didn't, you know, I didn't know the measure of what that what that represented. But I taught, was teaching them math, and I recognized that they didn't have any damn skills. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it's like, well, granted, they didn't have any math skills, but I talked to them about things. It's like y'all are about half of you are like literally idiots. Mm -hmm. um, you need to go to work and get yourself knocked down five or six pegs before you're going to be ready to start making anything and get on a career path that's going to land in the six-figure range. Um, and that entitlement that you're kind of addressing there is is a major ingredient in the problem that we've landed ourselves in. So I guess, uh, so that's one thread of it is kind of, you know, the universities being this like kind of factory to, to continually create this type of person coming out. Um, in, in terms of like critical theory and, and that idea and where it comes from, um, a lot of people are familiar or at least have heard the term critical race theory. Maybe they don't know what it means, but it actually comes back to critical theory. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's interesting. Um, I don't know if you've read Andy Noe's book, Unmasked. Um, he does a really great job in kind of taking a look at um, like where this stuff comes from, from the Frankfurt School and, and things like mm -hmm. that. And I, I think people don't realize it's actually it's a Marxist type of, of idea, like um, what, what Mark Levin calls cultural Marxism. You're creating two classes and you pin them up against each other and it's not economic like, we, like we've said. So in terms of like critical theory and, and where it comes from, you know, where does that idea of critical theory come into all this? Okay. Yeah, I have actually, you know, read Andy's book. I actually was on the phone quite a bit with Andy when he was writing it. And oh, cool. Responsible for some of his understanding, for helping some of his understanding of, of critical theory in the Frankfurt School. Cool. Um, I did not talk to Mark Levin as he wrote his book, though. Uh, but I do know quite a bit about this. Um, so you are right. Cultural Marxism is is this turn. I, I'm going to go all the way back, though, before that. So what happened in the 1840s, Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto. In the 1860s, he writes uh, Das Kapital and, uh, or Capital. And communism is well on its way as a philosophical movement. As a Basically what he did was he co-opted a lot of different branches of socialist thought uh, and turned them into the Marxist program, uh, which was supposed to turn capitalism into socialism via a revolution, and then the revolution into socialism would then eventually lead through the application, the, the consistent application of socialism by the right kinds of people, uh, namely Marxists, would lead in the end to a perfect classless, stateless society called communism. And so what we have is this is nobody's doing this anywhere. And then in 1917, we have 
uh, it happened in Russia. Mm -hmm. So Lenin, Lenin gets sent from Germany to Russia, uh, goes there, sets himself up in, in, in charge of the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks actually claim the mantle of the vanguard of speaking for the proletariat, and they're going to now install this. And in the peasant society, and I bring that up for a very important reason, the peasant society of Russia, um, they were able to conquer and take over and establish the Soviet Union, which is the first socialist state, which was obviously a gigantic catastrophe, uh, millions dead, etc. Um, now, what's going on here is that Marx had this idea, though, that did not agree with this. Marx believed that history pr proceeded scientifically according to certain laws that he had figured out, and that the laws of history that were where the economic conditions progressed in a certain way, and so they went from feudal or sorry uh, primitive communist tribes, like if you're in the the tribe or whatever, everything shared, but the tribes don't get along. They don't know each other. They're estranged from each other. They're at war with one another. So it's not global. It's l very small and local. Mm -hmm. Communism. And then eventually uh, tribes start to dominate over one another and enslave them. So you enter into slave economies and those kind of reach their pinnacle at what the United States was doing with kind of, you know, chattel slavery of uh, by race. And then in this eventually, though, progresses into a feudal system where you have lords and ladies who are the land landholders and they establish these big estates. The aristocrats establish their estates and the serfs work for those various estates. So they're technically still slaves, but kind of not as brutally mm -hmm. and then this eventually they, they gives way to the serfs are like wait a minute no we can just have our own property let's cut this land up Pen william penn doesn't need to own all of pennsylvania let's slice this sucker up and give us our own plot you know 50 acres and a mule or whatever and let us have a go of it and we're going to make something else and capitalism is born out of this transition but then mark says there's still these contradictions within it and then we're going to get into the need for a socialist revolution and so on well Here's the thing. There was no socialism. There was no Marxist revolution that happened in Berlin. There was none that happened in London. There was none in Paris, none in New York, none in Chicago, none in Los Angeles. But you have one in backwards peasant Russia? Something in Marxist theory has gone wrong. And so what you had was this movement in the 1910s, in late 1910s going into the 1920s, uh, of Marxists like George Lukács in Hungary, like Antonio Gramsci in Italy, even the precursors to the Frankfurt School that emerged in 1923 in Germany, who started to say there must be some other factor that keeps Marxism out of Western societies. And they said, well, it's got strong cultural roots. Mm -hmm. And those cultural roots are easily transferred from one generation to the next. We're raising up our kids, as the Bible says, the way they should go, and from, from that they'll never depart. And so this has to be taken apart. And so now we're going to attach attack the cultural pillars that maintain the people's desire to stay in uh, a capitalist system is what this cultural Marxism that emerged in the late 1910s and early 1920s is all about. So in that tradition, a few years later, we actually have something very significant that a lot of people don't realize happened was Marx's first big philosophical piece that he wrote was in 1844, or maybe not his first, his second, which is called the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts that lay out his whole philosophy of the world and life written in 19, or 1844, wasn't published until 1932. Mm. It was kept secret until 1932. And this lays out a very different kind of program that was about what Marx was really about before he wrote the manifesto, certainly before Capital. And then when these Marxists of the 30s read this, they realized, you know, we didn't get it right. This is what was, you know, we need to use this. And then we need to use these other ideas, emerging ideas like Max Weber's sociology, like uh, Freud's emerging uh, psychology, field of psychology, to understand what's really going on. And we're now going to attack from the, the pillars of society by psychological and sociological means using this deeper understanding of of Marx's philosophy. And this is what got called critical theory, mm -hmm. which a education Marxist tells, uh, named Isaac Gotsman in a book called The Critical Turn of Education. He says we shouldn't call it critical theory. He says we should call it what it is, critical Marxism, which is this approach to Marxism that uses criticism as its primary tool, the criticism of everything. Just con uh, It's like, it's like postmodernism in history. It was something that um, I, we had to study that for one semester, and I, I wanted to bang my head against the wall because it's the craziest thing, but it's the postmodernist view of history. It's, it's a similar concept. 
Yeah, that came up actually later in the 60s and 70s as this all evolved. Um, the postmodern concept out of various schools of Marxist thought evolved in the, from the late 60s into the, into the 70s and 80s um, and, and kind of extends some of this thinking. But the general idea here is that they thought if they, they could get into these cultural institutions like religion, family, education, media, law, now we have health care uh, as a cultural pillar, if they could get inside of those and change over their commitments to Marxism, and if they could do that by getting inside of them and engaging in ruthless criticism of all that exists, um, Max Horkheimer said that the point of a critical theory, and he's the one who named critical theory, who invented critical theory, Max Horkheimer said in his own words that the point of critical theory, the reason he invented the critical theory, was because the, the ideal society or the good society or the perfect society cannot be described in the terms of the existing society and all we have available to us is critique and criticism to to to, to criticize the existing society and what it, it's not why it's not good enough in other words why it's not communism and the other critical theorists or critical marxists through the middle of the 20th century echoed this thought Theodore Adorno said something similar. He said, you can't cast a positive image of the utopia. You can only criticize what we have for not being the utopia. Uh, Herbert Marcuse said, we we can't actually describe certain historical possibilities that have become regarded as utopian possibilities, but we can engage in negative thinking so that we can un peel away the problems that will allow the perfect society that's contained within our society to, to come out and flourish. And so criticism, 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 criticism is where this all came from. But in the 60s, they realized that the economic game wasn't going to work. They realized that when you agitate for economic reforms, say as Marxists often did, and the labor movement was sometimes Marxist and sometimes not, or I should say some parts Marxist and some parts not, when you agitate for economic reforms, eventually you get them. And all but the l most lunatic radicals, once you get those, are like, yeah, okay, got it. You know, okay, now you can't dump chemicals on us at work and we're responsible for it. Okay, you know, you actually have to provide a safe working place. Okay, you can't make us work 16 hours a day. Okay, you know. It's a kind of an end game. It's not really an ongoing struggle. Correct. So most people in the movement are like, okay, we got what we want. And yeah, the there'd be no more like, need for a movement then at that point. Exactly. And the Marxists got pissed about this. And they said, well, the problem is that capitalism will actually, as you start to agitate for economic reforms, will stabilize the working class. And of course, they're all conspiracy theorists. So they say they stabilize the working class specifically. They, they, they specifically stabilize the working class so that it won't be revolutionary. So we can't have a Marxist revolution. And so, well, that's bad. So what do they say? Where do they say that energy lies? Identity politics. Mm. As, as Herbert Marcuse put it, the ghetto population. He also named the feminists, the sexual minorities, the unemployed, the outcasts. Um, and so they started to try to create identity politics-based critical theories like critical race theory emerged out of this a couple of decades later um queer theory emerged out of this a couple of decades later so they started to create critical theory based versions of things like feminism of gender studies of race uh liberationism etc and they created what well, i refer to this as identity marxism uh out of this and that's what woke kind of developed from it incorporated postmodernism it incorporated ideas from critical education theory but that's what woke really came from and that's the origins of this cultural marxism uh and then later critical marxism and then what, what we might call woke marxism today well you know what's kind of interesting about that james is I, th I think a really interesting barometer of this is if you look at in the last 50 years like how much less spiritual we've been you know whether it's whether it's your your catholic or your jewish whatever it may be like we've gotten a lot less of that right we've become a very non-religious people and I, and i think that's the really big indicator of kind of what's happening would you agree with that you know there are certain degrees that where that's true it's you've got to be careful because there's a very naive interpretation there that oh well if we're religious then this isn't a problem but liberation theology is marxist yeah no, i would agree with that i had to study a lot of right? my theology classes that's a bit wild and <laughs> they are currently trying to wokeify all the major religions and major religious denominations of the world at which point the flocks will be regurgitating woke that looks like Catholicism, or that looks like Protestantism, or looks like Judaism, or looks like Islam, but it's in fact wokeness using words like that. And so um, 
there is something to this idea that, you know, in the vacuum created by religion that people were able to be molded into this uh, situation. But there are actually kind of more nefarious circumstances than that. And you actually alluded to one a moment ago. We talked about how people are going to go to college and they're going to produce lots of these educated, entitled people who think they're supposed to have these great jobs that pay unrealistic amounts of money in an economy that isn't actually going to be able to support them and they're in massive amounts of debt. So there what you have is actually a massive seed of resent, possible resentment or potential resentment. And then you you fill these kids' heads with a critical theory that says that it's the system of society operating that makes it so people don't get what they want, so that they're victimized, so that, it, that the society is not working for them. And so these people steeped up in this ideology of basically some version of Marxism or another end up crapping out of the system, expecting to have the system take care of them, and the system isn't made to take care of anybody, in particular them, and so then they become very resentful of the society. The society must be the thing that's at fault. And you could say, well, it kind of is, because Bill Clinton shouldn't have signed that federal student loan underwriting, and it is a system. But what you can see then, though, is that the activists that were pushing for these kinds of changes all along were creating the conditions that they would then later exploit in people. And so this anger is displaced. The anger shouldn't be at the system. It shouldn't be at capitalism. It shouldn't be at whatever. It should be at these specific politicians and their parties that moved and advanced this football. Now, it's not a Democrat-Republican question, of course. It's really a kind of um, gigantic global technocrat whatever, you know, the great American empire or whatever the globalist American empire they call it versus everyday normal citizens of the, the the nation or nations that are involved in this huge attempted shift, but they should be mad at the right people. I understand their frustration. I understand feeling cheated. They were cheated. They were, in fact, manipulated. Um, so when you add in the fact that they don't have a spiritual tradition that helps them stay grounded through that very frustrating experience, you can start to see how it becomes very easy to channel them into those ideas that they've been indoctrinated into with the critical theory that it must be the society. And then what do they tell you to do? Well, if you do the work, we can fight, we can make a new society and a new society wouldn't leave people like you out. Uh, and you can really get them worked up. And then for the ones who come out and they end up with a six figure coding job or whatever, well, just think of how lucky you are. And it could have been, you might, what if you were black, you wouldn't have had a chance. What if you were a woman, even though women are outperforming men in most forms of attainment right now, you wouldn't have, they tell them you wouldn't have had this opportunity. It's so much harder. If you succeeded, it's so much harder for somebody else. And you can still keep them wrapped up in that. Our system isn't working. Our system isn't working. Our system isn't working mentality. But you can also see how creating that set of circumstances was either by intentional design or by absolute idiocy was was created it was it was made to produce that outcome and and has produced that outcome and maybe to produce that outcome i don't well, want to over speak there no it seems like it's a really long game which is interesting too because i think some people want to play it up to conspiracy theories some other people want to play it up to you know cabal theories whatever it may be but it does seem like a really long game and I guess, like, it, it becomes less of a Republican-Democrat issue, right? Because there's people on both sides that, you know, make me want to vomit. And, and I guess when we, when, we, when we look at it, like, like who pushes this then? Like, like where does the game come from, right? Because it's, we're talking about here it started in, like, 1932 and it's still going. So, like, like, who pushes the strings and directs this? Is it just the monetary system? Like, where does it go and where does it come from? There's a lot of different elements to that, and I don't think it's actually fully been mapped out, but we mm -hmm. do know a few things. For example— Because, like, I have some friends that go down these crazy rabbit holes. I'm like, dude, that's a little crazy, but I think there is there is some, some things to it. Right. Like, Well, a lot of people don't realize. For example, I mentioned Herbert Marcuse, one of these critical Marxists from the 50s and 60s. Well, before he was a critical Marxist theorist from the 50s and 60s, he was Herbert Marcuse working with the OSS, which was the precursor to the CIA. Mm -hmm. So that which became That was Wild Bill Hickok's group, wasn't it? Or not Hickok, uh, Wild Bill uh, Donovan. Donovan. Well, that, 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 he was the OSS guy. Yeah, that, that's outside of my knowledge, but that may be correct. I, I read so, this like really interesting book. If you had to get a chance to check it out, it's called Roosevelt's Secret War. It's about Bill Donovan and, and Roosevelt like putting together like secret whatever. Anyway, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, and so <laughs> literally in order to defeat the Marxists, or sorry, the, the, the Nazis, they brought in Herbert Marcuse, the German so-called anti-fascist, 
uh, who's a communist, and they brought him in with his neo-Marxist theories, and the basis of the CIA includes this. I don't know how much bleed over there is, right. but this kind of construction of what we now would refer to as the deep state uh, was happening in conjunction with these people. Uh, Theodore Adorno wrote, you know, very long uh, pieces like the authoritarian personality that were supposed to inform uh, those intelligence agencies. And, and, and so you have that aspect of it going way back. What you have- well, I in think the with the concept end, of deep state too, people like to, you know, like to put too much emphasis on like the idea of deep state. But when you think about it, it's just people that, you know, they're career people versus somebody that's there for an election cycle, whatever it may be. And if they're looking at it, they're like, well, I don't have to live and die with your four-year election cycle because I'm going to be here no matter what. So I, I think to tr- not trivialize it, that that that's kind of the simplicity of deep state. There is, but there's also the the capacity to move longer running agendas through those projects. So like these appointees with their 30 year project might, you know, a career might be in a position to where, you know, they have a 30 year long trajectory that they, of, of things that they want to achieve. And it's not really subject to the, the democratic or Republican, I really should say, um, political process where, you know, they are, they're accountable ultimately to the people that their, their decisions are going to govern. And so that becomes its own problem and it can become self-sustaining, but it can also have long-running plans to try to get to certain places. Mm -hmm. And there are good reasons to believe that that's a thing. I don't want to speculate too much about the deep state because I only know a limited amount. But what I can tell you more up front is, you know, if we just go back in time about 10 or 12 years, a lot of people realize that this kind of seems to have exploded around the 2010, 11, 12 range. And a lot of people pin this on Obama's second term in office or the where his big he had a huge change in his tone if you listen to him in 2008 it's all hope and positive he and became changing. very identity politics driven. very identity term, politics yeah. in for his second run including how he ran for president the second time and then in his second term in office not that he i mean one of the first things he did was sign the Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act and you know then he tri- tried to do Obamacare as kind of a nationalized health care stepping stone and so there are other issues here which of course then you have to look and say he modeled that after Mitt Romney and his so-called Romney care in Massachusetts so it's like this isn't just a Democrat Republican issue this is a broadly neoliberals having a gigantic plan for decades issue and um these guys are whether republican or democrat are in in cahoots with the the underlying neoliberal approach whether they want to take it this way or that way a little bit Mm -hmm. uh being the thing and so what you see though in the 2010 to 12 era is you also or even going back a few years before that is you start to see a massive amount of infusion of money from large left-wing donors and we could name bajillions of them that have been donating to different causes over time. Rockefeller Foundation's been doing this for a century. Um, Ford Foundation's been doing it for a century. But then you can, and Tide Foundation, Tide's Foundation has been doing it for who knows how long. But then you start to see the Open Society Foundation dumping money into the HRC, the Human Rights Campaign, not Hillary Rodham Clinton. And you, well, probably both. Actually, definitely both. <laughs> probably both, And yeah. so, definitely both. And so you start seeing him dumping huge amounts of money into that you see him establish the african-american policy forum for which is headed by the woman who named critical race theory kimberly crenshaw you start to see huge amounts of money coming in from from different actors you also start to see the formation of this weird the world economic forum already exists but you start to see them take up all of this identity politics stuff around the time of the big financial crash followed by what by occupy wall street which they saw as a populist revolt that was attacking the banking system Mm -hmm. the bankers and if you've read vivek ramaswamy's book woke i I actually just finished that we were supposed to have him coming on in a couple weeks yeah he's fabulous and so he actually documents the way that big banks like goldman sachs and now we have to look at things like blackrock and vanguard um started to take up in order to protect themselves woke politics and they started to fund woke movements and they look like the social heroes while they're actually busting up their opposition by and making that, the most divisive thing And that's such an interesting concept because people don't realize it. Like they found a ways to, to change how fines were paid so it made it look like they were donating money and they were still doing all the bad stuff. They just made you think yeah. they weren't. And meanwhile, they're they're paying these activists who do this crazy identity politics Marxist stuff 
to come in and get involved in these other movements like Occupy skewed left. So now they're going to get, well, although it was really cross partisan, um, but it skewed left. And so they start getting all these people. And I've, I've heard, I've seen interviews with, you know, uh, turned out there were white male leaders in Occupy who were very effective community organizers or whatever the term would be for them, who were doing, you know, very effective work within that movement, who then said that they threw up their hands in frustration and quit because it was always point of personal privilege. We have to let the black women speak first. We have to let the disabled people speak first. And it was like we can never get anything done because all we do is squabble about identity politics and who gets the right to speak first or most or whatever. And so really the point of bringing wokeness in was to break Occupy by putting something, putting ident- divisive identity Marxist politics into this movement and turning it intersectional, which is to say fracturing it into a million different useless pieces that can't do anything in a coordinated and, and, and effective fashion. So they started to pour money like a like out of a fire hose into woke causes from starting in around 2008 going forward, uh, but especially when Occupy Wall Street came on board. And then, you know, I don't have a better explanation, and maybe there is one without getting, like, deeper into serious conspiracy theory stuff. But the explanation that I have is they saw that this works. If you are people who want who have an agenda and want to play a divide-and-conquer game, identity politics works. And they put the pedal to the metal. They decided, you know, this is when the World Economic Forum started to push all of their stuff in that direction, that everything was going to be intersectional. We were going to start using critical theories of race. We're going to have to start looking at the global economy in terms of climate change and the way that that impacts women most. And the UN got involved in the same stuff. They realized that there is this absolute susceptibility throughout Western societies to identity politics done in this kind of identity Marxist way that could eat the society out from the inside and just like like an acid and just dissolve it from within. And that's exactly what we've seen happen. And now, 10 years later, we're finally catching on to like, this is what happened. But wokeness probably never would have gotten out of the university in any significant way had there not been these gigantic entities, these huge foundations. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funds most of it in education. The Rockefeller Foundation, Tides Foundation, Ford Foundation, Open Society Foundation, World Economic Forum, International Monetary Fund are dumping rivers and rivers and rivers and rivers. And I didn't even name all of them. Yeah. There's this new ESSER thing that's connected to the schools. They're dumping oceans of money into pushing these causes. And since they're absolute chaos and they're utter nonsense and nobody likes them and they're for the companies that get involved damaging to the bottom line, you have to, and through traditional customer-based models you have to say something else must be going on they're not do they're not spending trillions of dollars on this for no reason um but it's not organic either none of it's organic well it's interesting because this is something i was talking to, to zuby about not long ago i feel like it picked up so much speed in the last like you know you talked about around 2010 2012 like even I, half the movies i watched in the early 2000s like they couldn't make them now like um it, it's it's kind of wild how fast things have sped up um, and, and I guess to look at it, does does this fit in with the idea of the Great Reset? Is that not a thing? Is it a thing? Because I've heard some sides say conspiracy theory, thing. other sides say a thing. But then books you, about it. But then you have Klaus Schwab that looks like a, the perfect Bond villain. So I, I, how does this whole <laughs> thing fit in? <laughs> no, Klaus Schwab is the perfect Bond villain. He looks exactly like he came out of Central Casting. Um, which is great. I mean, he's wearing like a space suit. Ha- sometimes he's wearing a regular business suit, but he's like, sometimes he's wearing a space suit. He's a total weird guy. But he's been writing he, he books He reminds me of Goldmember from the Austin Powers movies. <laughs> yeah. He, 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 he's been writing books about this agenda since the 1970s. He's wanted to usher forth a fourth industrial revolution into a new technological era where man and machine are basically combined in some kind of transhumanist weirdo, something or another. And he's been saying the actual term, as far as I understand, I haven't dug hard, hard into this, but the term the Great Reset actually came from this totally radical activist nobody ever talks about named Richard Florida in 2005. And Florida wrote this book about how we're going to basically save the planet by doing a Great Reset and putting everybody into these super clustered smart cities and completely revamping our food supply and freeing up most of the land to be, you know, wild again. And w- w- this would require a great reset of our entire world economy into this kind of circular economy model. And that's what Klaus Schwab picks up. And then Klaus Schwab very ominously starts talking about the great reset at all of his Davos crap. So he's got this kind of like, what is it? $250,000 a year to be a member, super elite, hyper elite, you know, 
elbow rubbing club and they have a, well if you want to be in the club you have to pay the dues but you also have to sign on to these various principles they got like 23 of them you know but they're all like the sustainability goals and uh to whether it's whether an environment and state sustainability whether it's within um you know sustainable business practices whether it's in social politics you've got to get involved now and he's got this whole like to be in the cult, you have to sign on to all this this garbage and pay lots of money and go to the meetings in Davos and you get all this cool perks and you're rubbing elbows and connecting with and doing probably all these weird backroom deals with all these other titans of industry and government. In fact, that's a key piece is that the titans of industry and big players in government are both going to be there at the same time. And so they're connecting with one another, plus these huge nonprofit NGO foundation type things that fund everything. So you're getting funders, government people, and corporate powerhouses all in the same room, all on the same page. And then very ominously, like I said, in, right after the pandemic starts, by June of 2020, he's got a book out called COVID-19, The Great Reset. And he talks about the pandemic offering a very narrow window of opportunity to do a great reset to bring about a whole new economic system that's a circular economy, which sounds like circular reasoning is not good. Circular economy probably has suffers some of the same problems. Uh, we're going to have this totally sustainable circular economy now with a totally different model of capitalism that's now there's called no stakeholder. There's no ownership. There's um, like companies right. like BlackRock and people like that owning everything, and you're just kind of paying them to use it, like a usage fee. Exactly. Everything becomes a rental model, a by-use model, and that makes it more sustainable because you— I, we don't have to make, you know, a hundred different things for a hundred different people. You can make, you know, 10 different things and over time, all 100 people can use them when they need them. And so, you know, you, you cut down on waste, et cetera. They, they have this whole crackpot theory. And the idea, though, is we're going to now have stakeholder capitalism instead of shareholder capitalism. So the goal isn't going to be to maximize profits for the shareholders It's going to of corporate activity. It's going to be to uh, appease people appointed as stakeholders who are going to be these technocratic experts who get to decide, well, how does this impact the environment? How does so this is that where women? the idea of like ESG scores come in? The uh, environmental, exactly in. I always get the acronym wrong, environmental, was it social governance or social and corporate social governance? Social and corporate governance. Okay, there we yeah. go. Yeah, environmental, social, governance. And I can't ESG. remember if I had picked it up from you or from Glenn Beck originally, but I've been following this thread for like a year, and it's pretty wild if you really de- dive into it. We've been, we've both been talking about it. So the idea here is that you're going to have these stakeholders who are experts like John Kerry and Bill Gates who are going to be the technocrats. Mm-hmm. They're, they're unelected, unaccountable people who are like Anthony Fauci is, a, is the chief stakeholder of COVID-19, apparently, because he's the technocratic expert they've appointed to be the mouthpiece for it. And so he, as stakeholder, is now going to tell all of the companies how they're going to do it. But they can't just come in and tell companies how they're going to do it. Instead, what they do is they create these um, trading portfolios uh what do they call ETFs and things like that? Uh, and they score various companies and their stocks as picks according to these arcane measurements of of how environmentally friendly are you as deemed by people like John Kerry and Al Gore, uh, Bill Gates. How socially responsible are you as determined by feminists and critical race theorists? And how how good are your best practices in governance of the corporation as determined, as far as I can tell, by Nazis and fascists? Uh, and we're going to now increase your score based on how well you're performing in those. And in fact, they actually, for a little while, were doing a thing where they would rank, they'd go through an industry and rank all the publicly traded companies. And the ones at the top would get like a green, you know, thumbs up or whatever. And the ones at the bottom would get like a red thumbs down and they'd say you're lagging. And so they created this whole like kind of competition, like 100 yard dash game to get your ESG scores up and to not be the ones near the bottom, which meant adopting strict environmental policies in, in, in tune with the climate change cult. Uh, death cult that we have operating at that that level, and then radical social policies. So your DEI initiatives. I remember a guy came to me a couple of years ago and was like, "You need to develop the." And I've talked to some people about this for a long time. You know, trying to get one corporate training and like diversity, equity, inclusion, or something that replaces it. You need to devise the thing that untangles DEI and replaces it with something more effective. And that was a great suggestion if you operate under the delusion 
that companies are interested in doing what actually works rather than satisfying these arbitrary metrics. Mm. They're not bringing in DEI consultants just to protect themselves in liability. They're not bringing them in just because they want to be socially responsible or pretend to be and put out the mantle of virtue like um, Vivek's book makes so clear. It's also that they just get a higher score on these trading portfolios or they're allowed to be taken up by Goldman Sachs or Vanguard or BlackRock in terms of asset management if they have a high enough score. And so there's this completely artificial technocratic thing that's being foisted upon the world, stakeholder capitalism, to bring in a circular economy run by these goons. And Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum is one of the higher up people in that pyramid. He looks like he's the guy at the top, but from what I understand, there's probably three layers at least above him of people who we don't know who they are. And um, they're they're all kind of put and beholden to this because they're, they're trying to literally revamp the entire world economy. We're going to have digital currency that they control through a social credit system. ESG and, is and a that's social why, credit like, system something like already applied to stock prices. kind of worries me, by the way, because it's to me, like, you look at it and it's like, okay, so, you know, maybe it could be a great opportunity, but, like, what does government want? The ability to write down every transaction we have and know every dollar we have. That kind of scares me a little bit. Have you ever been to China? It's far worse than that. Oh, I've I mean, been to China. To- I've been to China. So I, we were doing business in China, which I don't anymore, um, back when we would uh, we would uh, uh, private label products. We were doing, like, uh, you know, plastics and stuff like that and uh we i had a phone conversation with one of the distributors we were using and the guy disappeared after he, we talked about some stuff on the phone i guess he shouldn't have said so yeah i've been to china <laughs> yeah so their social credit is 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 serious i mean they can literally lock you out of your bank account you can't purchase certain things if it's like maybe you go to the coffee shop you can't get a coffee because that would be something you enjoy it's like a treat or pleasant or whatever you can't buy that today um you may have to watch propaganda videos on your phone to get your score to go back up you can't buy a train ticket you can't buy a plane ticket if you hang out with the wrong people I saw a thing recently that they had added a feature to one of their Chinese apps that if you were in the physical vicinity too close to somebody who had too much debt, it would alert you so that you would move away from the person who has too much debt, uh, lest your social credit get stained by spending time with somebody who has too much debt. So if my friend, for whatever set of reasons, ends up with a crappy credit score, social credit score, and I go over and have tea at his house and dinner and spend time, maybe we're old family friends or whatever, my social credit score takes a ding uh, unless I can like prove by probably being listened to or whatever that I was actually trying to convince him to get his act together, which might raise my social credit score. So you can see it becomes this perfect storm for exactly the kind of woke bullying, but with actual teeth being able to well, lock you out of your bank account. And that's been my concern is I feel like that's where we're going, right? That's why that's why we, we, are going we started there. this conversation on wokeness and then we went to, to economics because to me, that's where I see it going and that's what really worries me. But I guess when we're looking at it like, you know, how do we stop ourselves from ending up there? What do we as everyday people do, right? Because just having information and being scared of it, how do we do it? It's absolutely that? crucial that people realize that the that this requires your compliance. Mm-hmm. If they advise you to get a passport app on your phone that determines through some digital QR code what you are allowed access to and not having access to, don't participate. Does that make your life maybe more inconvenient? If so, then that means you absolutely must not participate because you're being coerced and you need to probably engage in civil disobedience to start making problems for that. You also need to start holding, since power in a republic flows through the politicians and at the political level, it's different in, in corporate. Those people need to be held to account and sued and things like that for different things. But um, with so does it have to people, have hit like a critical a critical mass before it changes? And like I guess what does yes, that look like? Absolutely, we need enough people standing up and saying no, absolutely not, to where it becomes politically impossible. Which will inc- include if a politician stands up, somebody at the town hall or whatever should be asking him, "Where do you stand on this stuff?" And the we have to be so hardline as to say if they don't have a clear and strong answer against it. They're disqualified. They shouldn't mm-hmm. be supported. They shouldn't be voted for. They're not a good guy. They're pushing us in the wrong direction. The and this is where, we, if you want to play the conspiracy game, and I don't know how deep into that you want to get, it's possible that people like Henry Kissinger, going way back, were doing plans that said that let's build up China by opening up its market, turning it into a scary economic communist powerhouse, and then saying we have this enemy that's now got an autocracy, so it's very flexible, it can move very fast, it can respond to problems very quickly, and it's a huge open market and it controls so much of the world economy. We have to become like them in order to beat them. 
we have to now enter into we have to become Oceania to fight with East Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, we will lose and we'll have Chinese hegemony throughout the world. So it's create the monster so that you can justify turning yourself into a monster to beat it. And this is exactly the but kind then, of situation. Then, then, but then we, we end up right where in. we are, where you know freedom is slavery, you know war is peace, and we're all we're that's, all in fear of Goldstein, and that's right where we're headed, man. That's exactly what's what what the situation is. And so, how what can people do? Is they must absolutely refuse to participate. It doesn't. I can't get into my favorite restaurant with a vac, without a vaccine passport. Okay, then I'm not going to go there anymore. And I hope the place gets shuttered. Well, it wasn't the guy's fault. It's the politician's fault. Well, then the politician doesn't need to be a politician with any power in this city or this this county or this state any longer. That is the kind of attitude. And by every single legal means, and nothing illegal. We have to play this smart, but by every single legal means, the, whether it's recall elections, whether it's regular elections, whether it's putting up well-vetted candidates, making sure they're surrounded with well-vetted uh, teams, transition teams, and uh, you know appointees, etc., we have to be putting ourselves in the position to start squeezing every one of these would-be technocrats out of office everywhere, at which point we can start doing legislative moves that will start to turn around these problems. Um, judicial appointments that make it so that the courts start being sure to uh, decide favorably in terms of the constitutional freedom that we're guaranteed in the country uh, in the U.S. And if the U.S. stays solid, their whole plan is in a lot of shaky, shaky on a lot of shaky ground, and the other parts of the West will start to come back. Right now, they're virtually uh, on their knees or already fallen. Yeah. And so the, we, we hope the that US, the world does not become Australia is what we hope for. Yeah. Australia, the UK is not far behind. Um, Canada is not far behind. The Canadians I speak to now are so demoralized. They're so, so negative. They're so dark. You know, we're, we see it in certain states in the United States, New York and California stand out um, as following the same path. And the rest of us must absolutely resist um, we need to be looking for strong state governors who are able to leverage very vigorously the power of the Tenth Amendment. We have to uh, defy arbitrary power coming from the federal government, these illegal mandates and so on, because all of this is meant to get us onto a digital ID that's going to be connected to a digital currency that they are going to have absolute control over. And that's basically you can imagine a bull, and that's the people. And if you put a ring through the bull's nose and you put your finger in that ring and jerk on it, you can move that big bull around as just a normal little person. And these technocrats, that ring in the nose that they want to put in the nose is that social credit system. And that social credit system is forged in ESG, which they've already successfully convinced through this Davos network bullshit. They've already successfully convinced corporations to take up. So we're up against our corporations. We're up against... Um, Massive government power that's colluding in a so-called public-private partnership, that's the, the Klaus Schwab word for it, uh, with uh, the government colluding with those corporations. And the average everyday person has to just start refusing to go along with it. They have to see something like a vaccine passport or something not as a minor inconvenience or whatever, but literally as the equivalent of getting on the train in 1942 in Germany. Yep. And, and I think people are getting into the wrong terms on that, right? Because they're looking at, well, what is the definition of vaccine? Is it, does it mean you have the shot? Do you, does it mean you have the disease? And it says, I don't care what the definition is. There's right and there's wrong and just having it is wrong. And I think yeah, you the can't give into that. It doesn't even have to be the vaccine. It could be anything, anything right. that's going to require you to have some digital passport to be able to enjoy your, your basic freedoms. Uh, absolutely has to be resisted. The vaccine, by the way, is probably, I don't know for sure if it's got other purposes, but it is actually probably irrelevant. It's probably just a means to the end of getting the digital ID. Because I don't know if you've ever heard of this term. Some people are starting to use it, but the term is digital gulag. Have you heard this term? I, I have not heard that term. That's a first for me. But it makes so sense, right? Because you can put, it's, it's the whole idea of the metaverse, right? You put people people into the matrix type of thing. Sort of. You don't even have to get into I mean, you could do that. You don't even need the metaverse, though. All you need is the ability to completely lock people out of the ability to participate in everyday life, and they're in the digital gulag. So if, there's, if you have to, say, scan your phone to leave your house 
or at any point you might be stopped by a police officer and if your pass isn't green and you're outside of your house or outside of in Australia five kilometers from your house without a justified reason that's been documented or maybe there is no reason allowed or maybe it's 800 meters from your house or maybe it's a hundred meters from your house if you're outside of that range and you can be uh, fined or imprisoned for that you are effectively in a digital gulag. If you can't access, let's say that you like to watch whatever shows or whatever on your phone, or you like to, you know, whatever you do to unwind in your own house, if you want to be able to do that, then you have to have a certain score. So you have to go watch these propaganda videos. That's digital gulag. Uh, if you think, well, I'll just put my phone down and I just won't participate with it. Well, you know, it just locks you out of more and more and more things unless you check in every hour. That's digital gulag. These are all things that are completely conceivable at this point. And I'm not saying any of this is on a plan that I know about or any of that. I'm just saying these are all conceivable Right, it's a, it's a possible thing that could happen based on what's occurring at this time. And so what you don't need is a Kuf camp gulag. You don't need a camp somewhere in Siberia. And what people need to understand also is that the, what the point of a gulag is. The point of the gulag was not a prison. It was not a labor camp like the Nazis ran. The gulag was something different. It was a re-education camp. You would go there to do, it was, of course there was labor involved, you would go there to do labor to be educated in the Marxist ideology of labor. You would go there to work in order to learn what work is really about according to Marxists. And people who uh, couldn't get it would be marked uneducatable or unreeducatable and would be killed. Um, so you can digitally gulag people to where they're essentially under house arrest by means of not being able to participate and it being illegal to be too far away from their homes very quickly and easily. And in fact, we're not even in the realm of science fiction here. We don't even have to add in drones to police it. We're just what's happening in Australia already with police checking your, your, your papers. If you were more than a few kilometers from your house, you could be in trouble. It's already actually happening. The idea of a digital gulag is where that social credit system is going to land you. And mm -hmm. so the amount of control they'll be able to exert over your day-to-day -day life if there's a social credit system in, in place is virtually infinite. Uh, at which point, at some point, most people will psychologically break and say it's just easier to go with the current than to keep fighting this. They don't want to live in a shadow economy where they have to eat their government mealworms or whatever because that's all they're allowed to eat until they get their score above a certain thing or whatever. Like, people will eventually, most people will cave in, and then you will have no freedom. Your definition of freedom will be to be a slave in the system where you're going to have to wear some kind of a thing like your, like your uh, what do they call it, whoop, or these uh, the things that count your steps or whatever that, that um, is constantly monitoring your heart rate, your breathing rate, your body temperature, like all, all that data. Super valuable. That's what these corporations, that's the deal they're making. All that data is super valuable. What does your heart rate do in the 20 minutes before you decide you're going to go buy this major ticket item? That's very valuable data for them to have. Well, it's I think not it like, brings us back to something we talk about a lot in this show, right? And that's like, you know, to be free, you have to be responsible, right? The more free mm -hmm. you want to be, the more responsible you want to be. The less responsible you want to be, the less free you are. And and I think that's something that actually scares people is knowing that in order to be free, they have to have responsibility. And, and a lot of yeah, people just can't do that. That's the ultimate essence of liberty. Liberty and freedom are not the same things. Freedom is actually really dangerous. Liberty, on the other hand, is when you have freedom coupled to taking responsibility. Um, and so that's a very important distinction to make. And it is. It's hard. Responsibility is hard. Being an adult is so hard that millennials invented a word, adulting, that's a bad word, that they didn't, that's the thing that they didn't want to have to do. Right. Um, and so, but what people have to realize is that playtime is officially over. Mm -hmm. uh, we are now at the place where, and I'm not saying that people in China are generally miserable. I'm saying that people in China are generally aware of the fact that they can be made miserable at a moment's notice by the government for arbitrary reasons and that they have virtually, because I've talked to many Chinese people about this when I've been in Beijing, um, they, they have virtually no opportunity. For example, in China, it's not legal for more than 50 people to get together in a single place unless the government has approved it and has, you know, kind of chaperones, commissars present. 
So you can't organize a movement. You couldn't have CPAC or uh, Turning Point USA where people are getting hundreds or thousands of people are coming together for a conference to discuss ideas about, you know, a different vision for America or whatever else. And the woke people should get their act together real quick because they think that this is on their side, but they're getting used. Mm -hmm. These corporate masters do not give a flying crap about woke beyond the fact that it's a very effective tool for that S. But once the social credit score is in place, they can keep playing that woke identity politics game as long as they want. But in no fascist takeover in history has it ever been that the shock troops were treated well after the revolution. Yep. So the woke are getting used by these globalist Nazis. And, and I say that with very little hesitation. And what's going to happen is, oh, it's about women and it's about black people. It's about global, you know, north versus global south. It's about all these social justice issues. That is going to get dropped so fast. And all of you little critical race theory agitators are going to be in a digital gulag for the rest of your freaking lives because it was never for you. Well, James, I've really enjoyed this conversation today, and, and, and I'm, I'm really you know, glad that you came on because this is exactly you know, the education I really think the audience needed today. So for people listening, um, I know you are at Conceptual James on Twitter, which is where I follow you. Uh, you're also writing over at newdiscourses.com. Where's the best place for our listeners to go check you out? The, you just said them, at Conceptual James, across most of the social medias, there's a couple of them I haven't set myself up on yet. Uh, I'm most active on Twitter. Most of my social media is actually not even me. It's other people mirroring my Twitter onto the other platforms as best they can keep up. Uh, so Twitter is the best place to find me, at Conceptual James. My company is New Discourses. The website is newdiscourses.com. Its social media presence is at New Discourses, so you can find all of my stuff there. Biggest thing I'm doing right now, keeping up with, by the way, is the podcast that I'm doing on New Discourses. The episodes are deep, they're meaty, they are intense. I blow my own mind half the time when I make them. So I hope, you know, a lot of them are two hours, three hours long. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm told people get a massive amount out of them. I understand that they're difficult listens, uh, but I do encourage people to check them out. If you really want to know what's going on in the world today, I don't talk a lot about the ESG stuff, et cetera, yet, but I mostly stick with Marxism and critical theory and cultural Marxism and identity Marxism and et cetera. If you want to find out what's really going on with all this stuff today, go check that out and, and, and see my in-depth deep dives where I just talked to this here microphone in front of me for like anywhere between one and four hours at a clip to try to convey some complicated idea and history of ideas that have led us into this bad situation, which I hope will get people the kind of understanding necessary to A, want to fight and B, be competent at fighting back uh, and putting a stop to this before it ruins everything. Very cool. James Lindsay, thank you so much for hanging out with me today, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.